Well, it's over everybody. As of September 29th, the final manga chapter for Jujutsu Kaisen released and the final manga volumes are scheduled to release on Christmas Day. And when that happens, the Jujutsu Kaisen story will have officially come to an end. Gege, for me and everyone else, we thank you for writing this story because it was such an amazing journey. And we thank you for putting the pen down as well. And now we are all free from your terrifying and cursed writing style. I will never forgive you for Nanami, you stupid son of a- You took everything from me! Okay, but let me get serious because I am gonna miss this series. I'm gonna miss this manga a lot. And did I think it was a perfect series even before the ending? Nah, I don't hold it in that high of a regard. But my, my god, god, it was really exciting and the fights to this day are some of the most creative I've ever seen from a series. It can't be denied either that this manga took over the world in such a short time. If you read the manga, or if you're into the anime, or if you're just on the internet all day, you at least know about Jujutsu Kaisen's existence. And even if you've never heard about Jujutsu Kaisen, you most definitely have heard the name Gojo before. Dude became such a generational character in such a short time, even though he wasn't even the main character. But when the story did focus on Gojo even a little bit, he would always be treated larger than life. If you know about Gojo, you most likely recreated his infinite void hand sign or have seen someone else do it. Also, fans will now see an actor do a hand sign like that and schizophrenically think that the actor is a JJK fan as well. Like, I'd be shocked to learn if Killian Murphy actually even knew who Gojo was. In a very short time, this really became one of the top selling mangas and it recently passed 100 million sales in manga volume. So, good job, Gege. Just like Isayama, you too can make a spa pool out of the tears of your readers. Both sad and angry tears. Seriously, I'll talk about the ending in a bit, but there's a lot to cover, including story moments and memes. Uh, I figured to celebrate the ending of JJK, I'd make one last Lobotomy Kaizen video where I talk about all the funny memes, talk about the ending, and then go over my favorite moments in the story. But if there's one thing that I'll really miss about reading JJK, it's the insanity of the fandom. <laughs> oh, and the really cool fight scenes, I guess. Those are cool. The readers of JJK and Twitter League people have all fucking lost it. I think some nigga was born to go to hell. He may be one of them. <laughs> Just know October was an interesting month to be a JJK fan. You got people who have found peace with the crazy cat and are saying their thanks to Gay Gay, or you got the people who are mad as fuck about the ending. I want you to kill Gay Gay Akatami. Either there was some piece of information that they wanted to know about a certain character that they liked wasn't answered. Maybe they're still mad at Gege because they killed off their favorite character, um, wink wink. Or they feel the ending was rushed because by the time there were five chapters left, the readers felt like Gege was saying, fuck you, that's the end, bitch, haha, -ha, to them directly. <laughs> Not trying to spoil anything right now since this is the intro, but you know, we'll get to that. Also, by the way, hopefully with JJK ending, the manga leak culture will end as well, because I have a feeling this contributed to a lot of the negative backlash towards the ending of JJK. I'm not saying people don't have their valid criticisms of the ending, but I think because of really rough translations and such, it didn't help with like how people perceived the ending and just the story in general. And it's not like John Weary was helping out with any of it. Cause I mean, there was a lot of enjoyment when it came to reading this story. The fights were very entertaining. There was some really great characterization and I think there was just a lot of good community surrounding this manga. To fan animations, to the edits, and to the fan theories that everyone came up with. So it's interesting how some people can just assume the entire story sucks just because of a rough landing. Because I still believe Jujutsu Kaisen is a great story that gave us some incredible moments. But I mean man, the hate has gotten so bad that we got people saying that they're going to rewrite the story starting from chapter 236. And at first to me it looked like a normal fan fiction type of like scenario. So it didn't look as bad but when you actually look closer, it looks more like an Attack on Titan Requiem situation. And if you know about all that, then you can guess how similar this rewrite project feels. It just feels like a bitter fan fiction that's made in poor taste. It just feels like the equivalent of this One Piece meme. Like, it's so fucking funny to me. Like, what the hell is this? Gear death? I'm so glad this isn't real. Thank you, Oda, for being the one who actually writes One Piece. Hopefully this isn't real. I mean, I don't think it is. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, there's just a lot that's been going on here, so let me organize this video and start from where my last Lobotomy Kaisen video left off. By the way, a little reminder for anyone who's here right now. This is a manga talk video, so if you're one of the lucky ones who has been avoiding all manga spoilers and are waiting for the anime to come out, then... <laughs> I mean, I literally put the word spoilers in the title, but maybe it just wasn't enough. But yeah, if you want to go avoid manga spoilers, then... Duh. <laughs> Okay, let's go! Alright, so last video I left off talking about JJK, we got to the point of the story where Gojo quote-unquote came back, but of course it was Yuta using 
Kenjaku's curse technique, and even before that, so much was revealed, including the connection between Yuji and Sukuna. Fucking Uncle Kuna went a thousand years into the future just to berate his nephew and just fuck him up. He's definitely a generational hater, gotta give him that. And of course, even while Yuta is technically piloting his own Ava, he can't properly use Gojo's techniques. Because since Gojo died, he doesn't have the six eyes. Since the six eyes was basically tied to Gojo's soul. <laughs> Sukuna is basically dog walking him only because Yuta is having trouble trying to use what Gojo has been training with for over a decade. And to add on to this, Sukuna is more cautious because, I mean, Gojo fucked his ass up in multiple ways during this fight, even though he won. Baraga! So yeah, bro just locked the fuck in this time, but right as he started to catch on. Baby, you got something in your nose. Sniffing that K, did you feel? Boy got hit with the Black Beatles challenge! <laughs> Sorry, that was a dumb joke, but imagine being a thousand-year-old fighter who has trained and fought many strong sorcerers, and then the one thing that is able to hold you in place is a goddamn audio recording that you're seeing for the very first time. Like, you don't know what the fuck this flying object is, but it was able to stop you in your tracks. I'm so glad Inumaki got a moment to shine, because I thought Gege forgot about him. I mean, there's a lot he might have forgotten about, but I'll talk about that in a bit. But hey, the boys got the jump on Suki Poo, so now it's time to finish the fight! Ah, oh, well, never mind. Kenjaku's curse technique timed out. Ah, oh, well, game over. Kidding, we got like eight chapters left. So once Yuta falls over, taking a nice dirt nap, Toto and Yuji pop the fuck off. Yuji's moving so fast because of Toto's boogie woogie technique that Sukuna is getting a damn headache trying to stop the flash step. And Yuji is just beating the piss out of this old man to the point that he's actually throwing up the fingers. Yuji, you are a G and fuck everyone who is calling you a fraud. Anyway, Sukuna is doing his damn best to keep focused, but then we got Hana back on the battlefield and you know what the hell happened. She sends a Jacob's Ladder down onto Sukuna while he's distracted and of course it hits him and then boom, the fight is actually over. Joking again, this fucking psychopath straight up climbs Jacob's ladder. This dude really is the king of curses for a reason because he's able to do stupid shit like that. He almost gets Hana, but Toto being a real one takes a black flash straight from Sukuna protecting Hana. But like nephew like uncle, Yuji goes ham and climbs the pillar of light as well even though he's getting burned to shit. Basically, he also climbed Jacob's ladder just like Sukuna because he ain't afraid anymore, man. He is more locked in than ever on the king of frauds. Also, look at this fucking panel, man. Yuji needs to sign up for the WWE, I swear. Also, I like how it looks like he's hitting the dial pose so we fight 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 some more and then we got this crazy ass moment in the battle where yuji finally pops his domain after all this time we finally got yuji's domain and i don't know what the hell it is huh? i don't fucking know gege never really told us what this does or what it's named because the manga ends in like seven chapters so they don't even give enough time to explain what his domain is even yuji doesn't even know what his domain is like he popped it not knowing what the hell was going to happen but he's rolling with it for a reason and you know th this fucking cat man i swear and i know about the whole history of domains how they were used to keep the opponents inside so they could follow the rules of the user's curse technique still though i wanted answers because this looks really interesting for a non-lethal domain domain expansion walk in the park. Anyways, Yuji and Sukuna are at the train station and they just start talking, just chatting up about life. And I mean, Yuji's the one doing most of the talking while Sukuna complains like a child who didn't want to go with his mom to the mall. Bro can't stand it, he just wants to fight and scrap up. But Yuji being the sweet boy that he is, takes his uncle Kuna to the park, go fishing for crawfish, and overall just takes him on a walk to discuss the beauty of life. The way Yuji does this is he takes a walk with Sukuna, showing him the places that he would hang out and spend time throughout his childhood. He's doing all these different activities Activities with him basically trying to show him why he's so happy in life giving Sukuna a perspective that he never saw a more positive one where he actually accepted love and being honest that's why this chapter is one of my favorites it shows how Yuji views his life and how all these little memories that he shares helped shape his positive worldview this chapter is Yuji trying to show Sukuna what he's missed his whole life true love and meaningful connections it's what he never got growing up yeah Yuji is trying talk no jutsu on Sukuna but he does talk very clearly and he does make a convincing point it's something Sukuna is able to understand, but in the end, he doesn't feel anything. He understands it, but it means nothing to him. Though Yuji figured he wouldn't be able to change his mind, he wanted to try anyways. It may have failed, but we now see what Yuji values most. It's not about how you die, but it's about how you live. After everything has been said, Sukuna actually came to the realization on how Yuji feels about him personally. He pities him. He pities the fuck out of Sukuna for feeling this way. For feeling so negative and pessimistic about life and how he just doesn't feel anything. He pities Sukuna for being an uncaring, unfeeling old man. So, as a final act of action, he tells Sukuna 
Tsukuna himself that if he releases Megumi and returns to Yuji's body, he will spare Tsukuna's life. And then Tsukuna constantly responds, Fuck you, I'm gonna kill you and your friends and I'm gonna have fun doing it! Tsukuna is mad. He's mad at the thought of someone like Yuji pitying him for not wanting to feel love, for not wanting to build a positive outlook on life. He just sees a pathetic, angry old man and Tsukuna hates that. Yeah, bro is just a bundle of hate and vitriol. Yuji's gotta put him down like a dog. Look at the bunny, Lenny. The bunny. But before that fight, we get a conversation with Megumi. Yuji has a talk with Megumi and he describes what he wished life was like and how everything that's happened to him made him so sad to the point where he can't find a reason to keep living. And Yuji understands this deeply. He gets it and he just can't find a way to tell Megumi on how to keep living as well after all that's happened to him. But what he does say to Megumi to bring him out of this funk is that Yuji saying in his own words that his life won't be good without Megumi by his side. It's kind of gay. Kidding, I actually think this is very sweet and lovely. Yeah, power of friendship or whatever, but it's cool here, alright? This shit ain't Soul Eater. I've never seen Soul Eater. And while this was going on at the same time, Yuji is just scrapping the fuck out with an angry Sukuna. So Sukuna's out here doing his hollow wicker basket bullshit trying to shield himself, but after Yuji says his piece to Megumi, he actually wakes up and uses his own domain powers to lower Sukuna's defenses. And my god man, this is one hell of a fight that I can't wait to see animated. So while they're fighting, Sukuna again tries to get the upper hand on Yuji by popping his own domain, but right as he's about to do that, Yuji's cursed arm armor finally breaks off to reveal that he is actually missing two fingers. The two fingers. Apparently to trick Sukuna into thinking that Rika ate the last finger, Yuji with Sukuna's technique etched into him tore off one of his own fingers and gave it to Rika so Yuta could copy the shrine technique, leading Sukuna into a false sense of security thinking that he's got the upper hand here, not knowing that there's still one last finger out there. The reason Yuji doesn't use RCT on his fingers is so Yuta could keep using the technique because if he healed it, the ability would be null and void within the curse user. I mean, he's out of the battle now, so I think Yuji just didn't heal his fingers so he could shock Sukuna. I mean, it did because he's standing there flabbergasted. Gasted. Also, we got this moment when Gojo was in Yuta's body, so you have Yuta with Gojo's mannerisms. Very freaky. So where is it? Where is Sukuna's last finger? I don't know, some long spiral staircase? I can't really tell where this is at. <laughs> But that's not important right now. It's the next chapter where we got the biggest surprise of them all. <laughs> she finally came back after what felt like two to three years or some shit. Just my god, I'm going to be real with y'all. Before this chapter came out, I was fully convinced that she was dead. The way Gege plays with death in the series can be insane and hard to get if you're not paying attention. These pages where Yuji was talking about how his worldview changed and the pages were showing off people that influenced him in his life and everyone on those pages were assumed to be dead. I mean shit, they literally put Junpei on there. Remember Junpei? But no, she's alive and well and has a fucking eye patch now, which is fucking badass. And shout out Arata, man. He's a real one. Who knew his little pain supplement technique actually kept her alive this whole time? I won't lie, when I saw this page, I did freak out a little bit. But yes, she's back, baby, and we are at, like, what, five chapters left in the story? Fuck you, Gege. You bring Nobara back at the near end of the story, and I wanted more missions and moments with the three best friends together. One of Satan's greatest... Soldiers! Eh, but I mean, hey, she's back, everybody. And since she's back, we can see exactly where this scene is leading to. Nobara, with her curse technique, uses resonance on Sukuna's finger to damage him beyond repair so that Yuji can deliver the final blow. This moment was just so unreal, I almost didn't believe that it happened, but I am glad that it did. Also, she looks cool as shit with that eye patch. Maito basically turned her into punished Venom Nobara. <laughs> Also, gotta give credit to the people who knew that she was still alive and was going to use her ability on Tsukuna. You were the smart ones who actually read the story. I mean, it was a thing that was going around for a while that Nobara's ability would be really helpful in the Tsukuna fight, but I didn't actually know she was gonna come out and actually save the day. Hey, well, it's times like this, I'm glad to be wrong. So she hits Tsukuna with the resonance, and Yuji says the ultimate line, Tsukuna, this really is our Jujutsu Kaisen. <laughs> Kidding, he says it's time to end this cycle of curses. Okay, well, I mean, before that, Yuji actually gives him one hell of a beat down. And he actually does a delayed attack on Sukuna just like the fight with Mahito. I'm telling you, the parallel of certain events in this story are really well done here. But yeah, he says it's time to end the cycle of curses and he punches Sukuna out of Megumi's body and then boom, that is the end of the fight. Honestly, I did not think Megumi was going to survive, but potential man lives on to see another day. Yuji walks over to uh, this fucking blob on the ground. Fucking people were calling him Pukuna. Personally, I think he looks like a smaller version of the great mighty Pooh. Hey everybody, meet Pukuna. 
What a fucking loser. Anyways, Yuji walks up to him like the true champion that he is and says the perfect ending line to this fight. He says to Tsukuna directly that you are me. Me. Yes, you! I am me. He's me. And I'm you. Yeah, just like with Maito, he goes up to Tsukuna and confronts him one final time, letting him know that deep down they feel the same way, yet both reacted differently to their situations. And Yuji right here at the same time shows just how much of a compassionate person he really is by saying that he is willing to accept Tsukuna one last time. He's hoping that Tsukuna will accept him and that he could live with someone and not curse them, but to actually grow a familiar connection to them. To actually become a part of someone's life and to grow as his own person. But he refuses and fades away telling him that in the end he's just a curse and right before this as Tsukuna was getting pushed out of Megumi's body Tsukuna was low-key trying to plead and mentally weaken him to stay in his body in a way Tsukuna was actually afraid of death here and was not willing to leave Megumi's body just yet but because of Yuji's caring nature and the words that were said to him he now actually wants to live again live for someone else and actually be a part of their journey that being Yuji and Nobara I fucking love these guys man this is such a great fucking friendship and that right there is the end of the Shingoku Showdown. Alright, final three chapters, here we go. So Megumi wakes up after being exhausted as fuck because, I mean, he got hit with a bunch of Gojo's Unlimited Voids and just a ton of black flashes, so it's no surprise that he probably took a few days off. While he's waking up, Yuji and Nobara actually come in trying to recreate the little surprise that Gojo and Yuji planned when Yuji was presumably killed in the beginning, but instead Nobara was in the box. It's pretty adorable, even though Megumi knew she was alive because she used the resonance. By the way, I'm just gonna focus on the main talking points for these final chapters, so that I don't spend too long just explaining everything. I'll go over them and I'll talk about what I think after. So the trio are sitting around having a chat and Yuji talks about how they both have their own personal letters from Gojo. Basically information that he wanted to tell them before he died. Yuji already got his conversation with Gojo but Megumi and Nobara have their own letters to them. So Miss Nobara opens hers first and it's the precise location of her mom who left when she was young. And she doesn't give a fuck. She just crumples up the paper and forgets about it. Shout out to the class Madonna, everyone. Megumi's reaction to his letter is the best, though. He opens up his letter and just starts laughing. And Yuji and Nobara are curious about why he's laughing. And why is he laughing, you may ask? Well, it's because Gojo says, Sorry, I killed your dad. And bro really just doesn't give a fuck either. It's hilarious. He's just like, eh, it's alright. Even though we only have them for like the last few chapters, it's cool to see these three back in action. And these last three chapters are basically the breather where everyone who is still alive talks about the battle plan and everyone giving their answers on how this whole Sukuna ambush played out with what their roles were and what they probably could have done better. And no need to worry everybody, Yuta is still alive thanks to Rika. Thank God too because he's actually one of the coolest characters in this story. We just spent time discussing on what happened in this final battle. We even got to learn of what the hell was on Yuji's arms. It was basically just cursed energy that turned into these cursed glove tools to conceal his missing fingers. Amaki thought it was a waste of time and how he should have just gone to Home Depot. Also, I do want to reiterate that I'm not going to go over everything since there was a lot that was talked about and shown in these final chapters, but I'll talk about the important things like how Wee Wee was actually kind of goaded in this final battle. He just kept teleporting himself on and off the battlefield to make sure everyone who was still alive stayed alive. Except for Gojo and by extension Kashimo, but I mean there was no saving that body because he got the Nanako treatment but like way worse. Anyways, everyone else is just hanging around talking about how maybe things could have gone better and how the Kyoto students were kind of useless and I mean, besides Toto, of course. Love you, Toto. And I know throughout the story, there was this joke about Miwa being useless, but she at least had some agency to jump in when she was able to use Simple Domain to protect Maki from Sukuna, so she wasn't completely useless. Momo, on the other hand, didn't do jack shit and couldn't do jack shit except fly people off and up and down buildings. Basically being a free flying taxi to fly Meimei off of the the building. But the main topic of discussion in these final chapters has to do with the new shadow style. Basically simple domains. I saw people mad that this type of info dump meant nothing in the final chapters, but I believe I get the purpose now after rereading the manga. It pretty much goes back to how the main sorcery clans had a big hold on cursed energy. They monopolized these powers just to use it in a way to fund their schools and themselves. They pretty much used these schools to send kids with cursed energy on jobs so they didn't have to do the jobs themselves and to keep a higher status in society. Even 
even though this whole time people not born in a sorcery clan or born with a cursed technique of their own have been able to learn the simple domain to protect themselves without the need to call for a teenage sorcerer. They would send kids on these really dangerous jobs to die and then the paychecks would come in and then the cycle would be repeated. Some context, back when this was all starting out, there was a binding vow that was contracted by someone named Ashia Sade Atsuna. I I'm completely butchering that name, I'm so sorry. This person made it so that the main clans and the higher ups can have a major hold on cursed energy and that the simple domain technique would be really hard to actually like branch out and teach people. But now since Gojo and everyone else played their part in taking down the old system, with the clans falling apart and everything, the new shadow style can be taught to normal citizens in case there isn't a sorcerer around to help them. This is basically cementing the idea of the new generation growing and learning from the trauma and pain that the older generation left. I'm probably butchering the fuck out of this, but hey, this is what I'm picking up from reading this story. Since the Zenin clan was destroyed, the Gojo clans and the Kamo clans are basically gonna kill each other off, so this whole binding vow shit will no longer be intact. So many lives could have been spared if they didn't hold this technique for their own gain, but this is what Gojo wanted, and life is all better for it. By the way, let me know in the comments if I missed anything or if I got something completely wrong. If anything, don't blame me, blame the cat. So overall, I think this chapter is good, but when it came out, it was definitely jarring because it was basically just a big ass info dump. But the next chapter is... Uh, I'm not gonna lie, this chapter had me mad for one reason and one reason only. Who the fuck is this? Did Takaba imagine a version of Ghetto slash Kenjaku that he did stand up with and now he's a living, breathing person but he's his own person? Cause we can't see his face and I highly doubt this is actually Ghetto or Kenjaku, so is it just a version of Ghetto Kenjaku that doesn't share the same feelings or thoughts and it's just Takaba's new stand up partner? <gasps> Sorry, I'm losing my breath here. That's a lot to cover, but whatever. I can't handle this story anymore. Gege, when I catch you, Gege. <laughs> Besides that, the chapter is sweet either way. You got characters moving on with their life after everything that has happened, and to finish off the series, you got the trio going on one last mission. And it seems pretty simple. And before I talk about this final chapter, people were actually theorizing that this ending seemed to be going way too well for everyone, because the title of chapter 270 is titled A Dream's End, which could mean many different things. But the main thing people were thinking of is that it's the end of Go Gojo's dream or another person's dream. So people were thinking automatically, oh well, that just means that Gojo is dead and his dream won't come to fruition, so, you know, I mean, that makes sense. But on the other end, though, some people thought that these last two final chapters were just a vision in someone's dying mind and that the final chapter would reveal that Sukuna won and the future belongs to him. I mean, that would be a pretty fucked up way to end things. But nah, everyone's fine. In fact, more than fine. Everyone's actually going on to live a pretty good life now. I'm pretty sure it was just some people who didn't like the ending that much that they were hoping for a worst possible outcome because at least for them that would make it interesting everyone died the end I mean, I'm not saying there aren't people with some valid criticisms that they have to say about the story and the ending, but some people were just so mad about how the ending went that they were just praying that everyone fucking died. Gay Gay Akatami. Please save me. Please save me. Gay Gay Akatami. Like, I'm sorry, you guys, but the weird one-eyed cat writes the story here. While everyone else cleans up their separate messes, we follow Megumi, Nobara, and Yuji on their last mission for the story. The final mission for the trio in the series involves a simple curse user messing with a woman and her fiancé. He basically bought her a handbag and got incel stalkerish-like, messing with their head and shit so that the three musketeers could handle it and throw him in a cop car or something. I don't know, maybe it's Ichi driving the car. Yuji actually takes some time to talk to the guy since he looks pretty sad because he thinks his life is over because he's very socially awkward with a bunch of curse powers. But with that, Yuji remembers the conversation that he had with Gojo, the one that would have been put into a separate letter for him if Gojo died. It starts out with Yuji asking Gojo if he could soul swap with him so that Yuji could learn some techniques from him for the Sukuna battle. But Gojo doesn't think he should do that since his own self and his ideals should die off just like the higher ups. This is basically a conversation about how Yuji will have to carry on Gojo's legacy after he dies in this battle. Gojo's basically saying that if he himself dies, it would honestly be beneficial for the future that he wants. Cause him dying is another part of the older generation being killed off since that's what he grew around and that's pretty much what he's learned. Also, Gege definitely wrote this line for everyone who wanted Gojo to come back to life. Haven't we had enough of Gojo Satoru? No, no I want more. I gotta have more. I gotta have more! <laughs> <laughs> but it makes sense because Gojo being the strongest shouldn't be the norm. It kind of wraps around itself with how Gojo kept on saying that he would win against Sukuna with the, you know, nah, I'd win panel. Nah. He obviously didn't win the one-on-one, -on -one, and during this conversation with Yuji, he even says that if he was to die, that Yuji should carry on his dream for the future of sorcerers. And with that, Gojo actually did win in the end because he may have lost the one-to-one -one battle with Sukuna, but all of his ideals within his students actually 
won in the end. He taught his students well, and I'm actually glad he wasn't brought back because looking back, this was a beautiful yet tragic end to his own personal story. But I mean, you know, I'm always gonna love and miss the blue-eyed princess of Tokyo. Yuji's gonna do great things in the future, just like as the way he talks to this new dude in the car. And before we end off the series, the final piece of the chapter involves our very favorite angry cursed old man. And Maito's here too, fucking prick. And he's basically calling out Sugana for lying to himself this whole time. Basically saying Sugana didn't really live by his own stature, but instead wanted revenge for those who rejected him back then. He himself even admits that he had a choice in taking a different path. He had two choices actually. What those two choices are, only he knows. But each path had a different way of Sukuna growing on his own. So with him losing to Yuji, he decides that the next time he is reincarnated, he will choose a different, more kinder path. While Maito struggles in the void for eternity. <laughs> Also, I'm pretty sure Maito refuses to resurrect because he knows Yuji will be waiting to fuck him up even more. And the final panels being of Gojo's students and Sukuna's last finger. If you think about it, the story just went in a circle. The story started with the box that should have been carrying Sukuna's finger and then ending with the box but with Sukuna's finger inside of it. There was this creator who actually talked about this thing called circle theory where the first half of the story's events would mirror the second half but in a reverse order. And if you actually do a reread of the series, there are moments in the beginning of the story that mirror events events later on, but have this weird switch to them. Events like Maki stabbing Sukuna in the back, mirroring Toji stabbing Gojo in the back. Or Yuji saying you are me to Sukuna, mirroring the line of Maito saying you are me to Yuji, but having it mean differently to him. There are definitely more instances of this happening within the story, but I'm already using a lot of brain power trying to put this whole thing together, and I'm getting burnt out, and I've been working on this video for far too long already. Like, I've been working on this since the end of September, and I do not want to think about JJK again until season 3 of the anime is announced, okay? Okay. okay. But alright, back to Sukuna's finger. What? Now, seeing Sukuna's finger what? in the box to ward off curses at the end of the story may feel weird, and it may come off as like the bad ending. Because Sukuna is technically still alive, and his finger is just in the same position as it was in the beginning where it warded off curses, so what's the difference? But when you put things into perspective, this ending of Sukuna's finger in the box has such a huge difference to how it was in the beginning. The big difference from the beginning and the ending is the status of Sukuna's finger. In the beginning, his finger was deemed a cursed object that wears off cursed spirits but also attracts them. In the end though, it is now considered a talisman that stays in the box scaring off spirits for good. It gives the idea that Sukuna is changing for the better. And I like how the visual of the finger looks like it's being held up by a hand, giving the idea that Sukuna chose a better path in the end. And with that, the story of Jujutsu Kaisen comes to a close. Whew, that was a lot to cover, and this video isn't even close to being over. I waited for the series to end to cover everything, but I didn't expect to cover so much, but wow, the story was something. I didn't even go over the fact that within one of the new volume releases, Gege Akutame actually revealed that there was a separate side character that he never put in the story named Usami. He was mentioned a couple times by other characters, but he was never actually officially within the story. So if Gege's gonna forget about him, so am I, because he's not relevant. Irrelevant! But before I cut to the chase and talk about, uh, my my opinion about the ending of this story. Let's go over some lobotomy kaizen memes and talk about how this community has been hilarious, talented, and concerning to say the least. The anime is still going on, so this fandom isn't gonna die out anytime soon, but god, waiting weekly for the manga chapters and then seeing the crazy edits and memes pop up are hilarious and also just fucking stupid. Why, what the <laughs> but also the fandom's got some talent that has people in it who make some amazing animations and edits. And by the way, if this is your first time watching this Lobotomy Kaisen series, let me give some context. For these videos, it basically involves me explaining the recent story beats and then using those story beats to flow into talking about the memes for those specific chapters. And then at the end section of the video is where I talk about all the memes and edits that I find online. And I mainly had this structure just so if people clicked on the video, they wouldn't get too spoiled by what I'm showing on on screen. I mean, I literally have like two to three spoiler warnings within this video, including on the title. So, I mean, it's your fault if you get too nosy. Sorry, I'm over explaining myself a bit. My bad. I'm autistic. Yeah, I'm autistic. But, anyways, anyway. last video actually had kind of a theme that involved the Drake and Kendrick diss. You had JJK fans animating and drawing art of Kendrick as either Yuji, Gojo, or Sukuna while Drake was getting his ass beat. Which is funny because Kendrick during this whole beef was being treated as a hero and a villain. Like, this shit is still so funny and entertaining to this day. I'm only 25, so I'm young too. To a lot of people, but I've never seen a rap beef bring so many people together to show support for one artist. Sorry, I'm getting off topic. I'm not a music channel. I keep forgetting that. I hate that. 
But anyways, this video doesn't have a meme theme of any kind, and I just figured to celebrate the ending of JJK, I go over some really funny edits and memes that I found throughout this past year. Whether it deals with the final chapters, or stuff that deals with the Shin Goku showdown. Or just memorable JJK memes that have been shown throughout the years. And if we're being real, this whole lobotomy kaizen trend didn't start until the Not I'd Win panel page dropped. Once that page came out, everything was downhill from there. Alright, so what the fuck are people posting on TikTok? From the screen to the ring to the pen to the Wow, we're already off to a great start. Also, we got this Transformers 1 artistry with Megatron giving fucking Optimus the Toji treatment. <laughs> By the way, uh, side note, please go watch Transformers 1. I really need a sequel. The movie is just so damn good. Now that I think about it, uh, me showing that uh, drawing right there actually might have spoiled all of you on what happens in Transformers 1. Nah, fuck it, I don't care. <laughs> This is insane here. Someone made an entire flipbook of Yuji and Sukuna to the theme of a Judas by Lady Gaga. Like, there's so many Judas edits of JJK, it's insane. But this one has to be my favorite. Like I'm saying, man, this fandom is filled with some talented people. Also, when I was saying that JJK basically took over the world for a short time, I wasn't kidding. It still kind of is, because now people are in their college classrooms reading the acronym RCT and immediately thinking reverse curse technique. Like, JJK brain rot is real. Like, people are starting to see Maharaj everywhere now from like bugs to posters in their classroom this bug rocks the most bizarre headwear in the animal kingdom the and of course, we still got some vibra slap memes, like, what the hell? You know, I can't lie, this artwork is actually pretty good. Also, we got this video right here, where someone paid Sukuna's English voice actor $100 to save this fucking shit. Domain expansion. Skippity toy! This right here, I have no explanation for. I'll just play it out for you. Also, uh, imaginary, imaginary technique, technique uh, fish. fish. Yeah, I don't really know anymore. I think my favorite lobotomy kaizen meme trend has to deal with Gojo going, Gome, Amanai. And there were a lot of them that I found. Gome, Amanai, 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 Amanai. Also, can't forget the countless of Gojo and Ghetto edits that came out that were used in the song Mr. Loverman. <laughs> Shout out Ricky Montgomery. Seriously, these memes are so funny. I even found one with Zoro and Sanji. I think I shared this in one of the last Lobotomy Kaizen videos. I, I don't remember which one though. And this one that is totally acapella. The ways that you say my name, Suguru, had me wishing I were gone. <laughs> I even found a Drake and Kendrick version. <laughs> Mr. Drizzy Fan. <laughs> and here's one of my personal favorites. I'm not key though. Who the hell is Gojo? Okay, so it's obvious that these two probably haven't read the story, but no joke, this girl going, who the hell is Gojo, is unironically pretty profound. Because who the hell is Gojo Satoru at the end of the day? I guess we'll never know. Anyway, speaking of Gojo, I think his death will forever be one of the most memorable in manga history. And not just because of how incredible of a character he was, or how sad the death was, but because his death broke so many hearts around the world. To the point that people to this day still want to believe he isn't dead. Yo, it's officially happening! JJK Chapter 272, Satoru Gojo is officially coming back! Gojo might be coming back. I'm sorry. I'm Gojo's sorry. coming back this year. I can feel it. Alright guys, we've been right this whole time. Well, things are not looking good for our blue-eyed king. I can't show the image. Listen, y'all know I would give Gojo that hot also, people were sending literal death threats to Gege Yakutame for killing off Gojo, which uh, <coughs> is kind of insane. I saw Twitter hashtags on Wednesdays talking about how Gojo is coming back in the new chapter leaks. You got people looking at other pieces of media and schizophrenically coding out the posters and trying to find a reason for Gojo to come back to life in a series that isn't his own. Like, the fandom is insane, and I love it. Great job, Gege. You managed to make millions of your readers insane, all because you drew a very pretty man and killed him in a very gruesome manner. Obviously, some of these are memes and jokes, but I do believe there are people that are coping this hard. They're acting like Gege has a secret chapter where Gojo was waking up on a hospital bed. And everyone gathers around and they all do a dance party and then they all play Fortnite together like, no, th it's over, man. He's dead. I mean, come on, everybody. Haven't we had enough of Gojo Satoru? <laughs> come on, y'all. The story's over. Go home. Go watch Dandadan Dan on Netflix. Why don't you come down here so I can suck your cock, pretty boy? Also, I think my favorite memes and edits definitely involved fraud kuna or sleep kuna memes. Seriously, whoever did the voiceover for this shit, you're the best. In the Heian era, a measly time, where plumbers in Sukuna reign divine. 
golden age of jujitsu. I would take time to go over all the very specific memes that came out of this fandom, but I feel like this would go over like two to three hours, and I don't know if I want to do that. Also, at this point, it would just turn into a meme compilation, and I'm not trying to do that. I like to yap and talk. But here's the last bit of the video. What did I think of JJK's ending? With all the mixed reactions and the feeling of it being rushed or bad, all I gotta say is, nah, I'm fine with it. I mean, it could be worse. It could be the promised Neverland anime season two ending. Will there be a second series to answer all the fans' burning questions? I really doubt it. Did Gege have more to say yet couldn't put those ideas out because of Shonen Jump scheduling? Yeah, maybe. And did the ending feel rushed in any way? Probably, it does seem like that, but Gege has always been a writer where he always lets the themes explain the story. It's just how it is, unfortunately. Not all stories are gonna explain everything. Hey, you know what? Fuck it. Let's go over a long list of things that Gege didn't talk about or at least slightly covered in the final chapters that a lot of people wanted answers for. By the way, shout out to Lightning Claire on Twitter who's done some translations for JJK. This list basically comes from her Twitter account. Alrighty, let's go down the list. Merger outcome, I believe we got that. I'm just fucking kidding, no we didn't. Tengen and Kujaku relationship, didn't get that. Hikari and Urame, we got that. Megumi and his father, I guess we got that. Nobara's status, we definitely got that. Yuta and Gojo's body, we got that. US military geopolitical strife, eh, I guess we covered that slightly. Jin Itadori whereabouts, no. Angel and Fallen Angel connection, hell no. Open barrier DE mechanics, eh, not really, no. Takako Uro status, nope, not at all. We don't even know where the hell she went. Takaba status, he is alive and well, and with a new Geto slash Kenjaku friend that he conjured up. Great three families resolution, I guess we got that, knowing the fact that they're basically just gonna kill each other off later. Poshingoku Jutsu, Poshingoku, Poshinjuku, Poshinjuku Jutsu Society. I can't fucking speak Japanese! I guess we covered that in like one chapter, but I don't think we even fully covered it. Sukuna's second weapon, Haitian's ability? Haitian's ability? I don't fucking know. I'm from California. I don't speak Japanese. I'm so sorry. Inverted Spear of Heaven's Broken Peace. People were actually thinking about that? Uh, I didn't think that was actually gonna come back at all. Megabee's Domain Expansion Backbone. Hell no, we did not see that. Maybe he did use it in Yuji's Domain during Sukuna's fight, but I really don't know. I don't think so. Shrine Mechanics. Uh, we did not get any explanations about how shrines work and all that shit, but whatever. Mei Mei's real name. I really couldn't give less of a fuck about that. First grade sorcerer Usame. We actually did get information about that, so yeah, there, there's something. Effects of breaking a binding vow. Nope. CT reversal mechanics. Nope. And unrevealed domain expansions. From Ryu, Ishigori, Yuro, and Yuki. Yeah, there's no fucking way we're getting answers to those three, especially not Yuki or Ryu. Yeah, there was a lot, and some of them actually did get covered in the last final chapters. Maybe not all of these things needed to happen or be talked about, but it would have been cool to have at least two or three chapters talking about the deep cut stuff. Like Yuji finding out that Kenjaku was his mom. Would it have been fun to see his reaction to that? Yes, but would it have mattered? Not really. And other shit too, like who the fuck did Takaba conjure up and why does he have Geto's hair? Fuck it all anyways, the cat does what he wants to and he's gonna confuse his entire fan base even up until the end of the story. Overall, my friends, I had such a great time with this series and I believe Gege did what he intended to do with it. Create a very entertaining story with deep themes and great fights. A lot of people complain about his writing style where a lot of shit isn't explained or like there isn't enough detail on a certain topic or theme or person, but I believe that was his intention. He does tell a lot and explains a lot when it comes to the power systems of his stories, but for some of his main themes, he doesn't do a whole deep dive into those. He lets the characters' words, actions, and interactions speak for themselves. And I really appreciate that, because as a writer, he trusts the audience and wants them to come up with their own interpretations for these moments. Maybe there were some things that needed further explanation, but with writing a story like this, it's really hard to keep track with a lot of things that happen. And also knowing the fact that you're tied to a manga magazine that comes out weekly to monthly, so it's really hard to keep track of a lot of the chapters when you're on a tight schedule. Also, Gege was going through a lot with getting sick and having surgery. Like, the dude probably had more to say, but he had to meet his deadline, so he couldn't really get all of his themes out there. But he did his best, and one thing we won't forget when it comes to JJK is how much fun it was. Well, fun is objective, I will say. It wasn't really fun watching Nanami die like that. Seriously, I can't get over the fact that Gege just went over board with this death. Like, he didn't mean to kill Nanami, but he just did it. That's my goat, everybody. I will be honest, this isn't one of my favorite mangas of all time compared to other stories. Not like it isn't high on the list, but there are some things that JJK does that other stories do better for me. Like Chainsaw Man. I fucking love Chainsaw Man. But I mean, hey, whether you like it or not, Gege Yakutame is still a really good artist and story writer. This panel in particular is one of my favorites, where it looks like Gojo is straight up dragging Sukuna across the pages. Like, it just looks so damn badass. I mean, there have been so many amazing moments that I can pick from the story, like the whole Shibuya arc, 
hidden inventory, Maki's arc, the really cool fights from the Cullen games, and the entirety of Gojo vs. Tsukuna. This right here was the peak of the story for me. So whether if I liked the ending or not, I would have appreciated the story either way because it gave us this fight. Because when this gets animated, the internet will shatter, I swear. With that, I'm gonna miss you, Jujutsu Kaisen. We got the anime, but nothing will beat the excitement of reading this back to back every week. Or every other week because your ass would get sick a lot. I'm dying. But stay safe, Gege, and I can't wait for your next story, and I hope you no longer have to deal with really tight deadlines. Alright, well that's the end of the video. Uh, anyways, bye everybody!